Can you just tell me that what are your background? Uh, most very sense. You? Uh, Paleontology. Paleontology. Okay. So you come from my community. Yeah. You are close to me. Okay. Yours? Yours? I keep using gender chronology. Gender chronology? Oh, I see. That's good. Yours? Remote Remote So you are from 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 Geography. So you? You want to say? What do I Why are you so quiet? We love it. Aerosol science. Aerosol science. Computer science. You? I'm not familiar. Oh, you are one of the speakers. Okay. Physics. Physics. And you? Aerosol science. Aerosol? Physics. Simple physics. Any kind can be used. You will hear physical concepts. Neutron and can is our neutron value. You? Yourself? Metrology, but I'm working on stabilizers. Oh, you are metrology, but you're working on stabilizers. Good. Huh? Oh, sure. What's your name? You? Civil engineer. Civil engineer. So, both of you decided to be together. Radar metrology. Radar metrology. So, you capture everything in the air in small sizes. In the atmosphere or what do you do? Yeah. It's ground based. Doctor radar. Doctor radar. Yours? Atmosphere. Atmosphere. Yours? Uh, aerospace engineering. Aerospace engineering. And cloud physics. And cloud physics. So you fly, you <laughs> cram. Nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with the air display. Okay. Who are left? Just give me a little background. Applied mechanics and hydraulics. Applied mechanics and hydraulics. Hydraulics. You talk about water flow or what? Water resources. Water resources. So you all are just water resources. Yes. Okay. Sweet. Remote sensing. Remote sensing. Then? Oceanography. Oceanography. Water resources. Water resources? Media. Media? I see. So you advertise for climate change? Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's not Yeah, but it's not bad. You are fond of climate change? Have you watched this movie called Day After Tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You were just saying GIS, we have students about the science of the world. You have. You are from? I'm from Shumabu, Kuala Lumpur. I see. Kuala Lumpur University. Aerosol science. Aerosol Yours? I am an architect applying for sustainability. Sustainability? Yeah. It's government. Earth system science. Earth system science. So you does everything, you do modeling. So where are you from? Specialized science. Okay. Geophysics, specialization, petrology. And we are working on operations. Geophysics. Atmospheric science. Forestry. Forestry. Yours? You told already. Okay, fine. So I am seeing diverse audience. Some of them are aware of something which I will talk about. Some of them are not. But we will still go through some of the basics. Okay? So now, when you talk, talk about paleoclimatology, it means the history of Earth's planet. So what does that mean? How does the Earth form? It started with the Big Bang, what do you know? When did it happen? Uh, you don't know? When did the Earth came into existence? Around 4 billion years. To be precise, it is around 4.6 billion years. Okay. So now we start with something, a concept where Earth got formed. So do you think that there will be a need of atmospheric physicists at that point of time? Was there atmosphere in the beginning? No, yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Yes. There's a lot of atmosphere. Okay. So what we try to understand in paleoclimatology is to read those kind of archives. So what are those archives? And we put a lot of effort and money for doing that throughout the world. <coughs> Not us in India, but throughout the world. We put lots of money. And why we are interested? We are precisely interested because of the one reason that you would like to know our past. Unless you know the past, we cannot talk about the future. When we talk about the climate, climate is not one day weather. It's the integration of several days of weather and climate, several years of weather and climate, several thousands of years. 
So it depends on different kind of archives which you are looking and try to talk about their system. What somebody was talking about the system, Earth system. So now talk about the system at that point of time, understanding their nature, their form of secretation, their composition, you try to understand. So what you are seeing here is that little man who is from the gender chronology, he will be able to tell that this is commonly found in trilogies and they grow incrementally with time. So what you see is differential weight of trees. So if you measure the weight of the trees, bring each of these weights, but say you can tell that how fast the tree was growing depending upon the water which is present here. It is so easy. So I am designing this as a rain gauge now, which doesn't do every minute, but do and do. So I am telling that I am converting this tree which has been formed in our wood years. These are peak plantations. I am trying to convert them as rain gauge. Those in the field of metrology, they know what is rain gauge. So now what you do is that you collect every day's the amount of precipitation, try to figure it out that how much it is, finally convert them into daily, monthly or annual. These are annual rings which get formed. This are one of this brain is animal brain. So it will get formed and you start reading them. Reading like, like what you see in the books, what you write in the modern go and read what you write. So you start reading them as a chapter, which has Earth's experience or the place of experience in the past. So now what you are seeing here is ice flow. So ice you get deposited and you can get deposited where it, it's kind of a rock, ice is kind of rock. It's a rock which is made of a mineral called water. Water is mineral. So it is made with a water which is mineral. So now you get ice in either two polar region, Antarctic or Arctic, and you get coal, ice coal drilled from there. And you try to reconstruct the climate based on the ice coastal and see that how the past was because it has also formed on top of each other, like what you can see. Each page in the book is lying on top of each other, so it's like a strategy that you try to retrieve. Similarly, you can retrieve informations from ocean. So ocean has sediments. So these are sediment pores which can be retrieved the informations. If you go beyond certain geological time when you don't have ocean flows, you can start depending on the factor, other things which are like fossils. So this is a fossil of something called trilobite. So the fossil which is similar to the fossils which we see today or their modern species are called cockroaches. So this is octopod, this insect which was prevalent during the period which is early part of Earth history. Okay, so now this is for example the fossil of fish. And then you have another fossil of fish, which are shells which are here in the bar. So all of them they represent the environment, they get formed in the environment, okay? So now many of you have come from different locations in India, okay? So now if somebody give me a question, that can I use a foreign science? That's what police does, okay? So if you commit a murder, I want to know that which location you come from. By knowing the chemical composition of your body's tissues, like hairs, like your nails, I can start talking about from which region you have come. So we use this as a forensic tool to retrieve that where this has formed with respect to presenter at certain locations, how was the environment, and try to give information about those objects which we retrieve from the nature. Okay? So now, if you think of some specific definitions, basic things, the magnitude of climate variabilities, these are some kind of landscapes which I am going to discuss a little later. There is time frame which is called phanerozoic. What is phanerozoic? It's a time when large fauna and flora evolved on this planet. So you, the magnitude of climate change or the temperature change witnessed during this period of time, based on the observation, shows that it has seen a large range compared to something which is rather very recent. If you think of annual range, the annual range of temperature change, which we experience, for example, in part of the world, it is between, say, around 30 degrees Celsius, when you say winter and summer time. So this is the kind of temperature range which we bother when we talk about the season. There were times in the past which are 
market, like tertiary, and the glacial into glacial time, but the magnitude of climate change was much, much clear. Like there was a least amount of change in terms of seasonality. For example, if you think of a little warm period, the seasonality was rather very small. Little I say, the seasonality was small. And the history of historic warming is always not so significant. So now, when you think of Phanerozoic time frame, which encompasses the time of all the flora and fauna, it is about 570 million years time scale. So we'll come and define this Phanerozoic time frame. So when you think of measurement of past temperature, we talked about the proxy. Proxy is like what you have in meter. So now if you say the thermometer, it's a proxy. Okay, is it a proxy or no? It gives you exact. When you think of the thermometer, is it give you exact temperature or it doesn't always give you exact temperature? What it depends on? How do you make thermometer? Yesterday you made some thermometer or you saw somebody making some thermometer? Or no? You saw. What is, how do you design a thermometer? Using a water body in a column glass in a column and then you get two different temperatures, maybe ice, maybe something boiling water, mark them, and then you start defining your temperature. Isn't it? So now you assume one important thing that there is a linear relationship between the height that assumption, right? From what do you think? If your column, the capillary, is not really a capillary, there is some small amount of nano disturbances inside, it may not show the right gradients. Now it depends on the design of the okay. Some thermometers are very perfect, some of them are not. So the evolution is that you started using digital thermometer, which doesn't take into account what you are measuring in terms of mercury. But which one you take precisely? Mercury thermometer you rely on, or digital thermometer? The reason is, can you tell me that why digital thermometer is not reliable compared to mercury thermometer? Still, we feel that the mercury thermometer is very precise. Compared to, the, I am talking about the extent of precision, compared to digital thermometer. It gives you accurate reading. The reason is following that the thermometry principle is based on certain concept. Okay, it is law of capillary action, which you can always define it using a mercury rather than using it a digital one. So intercalibration is a big exercise and it may not be perfect. And moreover, if you try to compare the results of the past when there was no digital thermometer, mercury thermometer is something which is was present. So you cannot compare the long-term record which is done with all the meteorological unit throughout the world. They were using mercury thermometer. Now what they do is that they use both. In majority of cases, what they do is that they get a bill reading randomly at a certain point of time to see that whether it is consistent or not. If they kept on using something which was used as a standard. Okay? So now that's the basic concept which is also used when you think of proxy development. So proxy means a thermometer, a method that approximates a particular measurement, example, a temperature. So those, what are the kind of proxies? So now we talk about high score as a proxy, where it defines in terms of temperature measurements. So now, when you talk about the ice core, what is it is made of? Of it is made of water. So when the water is you have formed, you have hydrogen and oxygen in it. So we measure the isotopic ratios in water and ice cores to talk about the temperature. So then pollen records. Now we will measure the pollen. Pollens are some kind of what are those pollens? They are derived from plant when they do the reproductive cycles. So now when you have pollen records, that also signifies the climate. Okay, talk about the temperature. Then you have plant macrofossils. When you say macrofossils, it means the leaves. You have leaves, we have stems, which are used to talk about the temperature. I will tell you how most of the things which you will come to know about how these are used in the next session. Right now, let us see 
the record and how the record looks like. In the next part too, you will learn that how you can use ice code to talk about the separation. You can use elemental ratios like strontium calcium to talk about the decoration. And then those who are working in the field of speedograms, what are speedograms? These are cave carbon deposits. They are found on, in the land. They don't you don't get it on the ocean. So now it talks about the terrestrial climate change using something called oxygen acid ratio. There are two different kinds. One grows from butter, another which are called stalagmites, which grows from butter. Those which hang from the wall they are called stalactites. So these stalagmites are found, or it has been justified, that they are representative of the change in precipitation conditions, which happens on the top of the cave. So now if you think of any kind of geological archives, which are going back in time, what you see is such kind of rocks. These are rocks which, how many of you come have seen such kind of exposures while you are traveling? Most of you. Okay? So now when you see such kind of rocks or features like this, these are called strata. The strata are like pages of your book. Okay? So this is book being bounded. That is what you can talk about it. So now inside this you have a lot of information. A lot of information in terms of fossil contents, it has information about the material by which it is made up of. And finally, what you do, you try to analyze them and see that it can reconstruct this place, which was once maybe part of ocean, part of other things, and talk about the environment of the ocean. And finally, you land up in talking something like this. So you start making such kind of visual interpretation of the data and say that this was a place which was having many of this mammal sitting there, there were maybe some kind of reptiles, there were figures, incisors, and they were present in those environments. So you try to reconstruct that environment. And this is this art which doesn't require much of what you don't do much of. You are not using theoretical information in this. You are using some way of information based on whatever remains or present in that environment. So earlier time when the subject of earth science was evolving, people were mostly interested in this, and this is the way the reconstruction went. So if you think of all coal deposits, what you have today in the modern world, they were discovered based on some kind of similarity in rock types, saying that such kind of rock type has an association where you anticipate getting coal of this age. Okay, so now you think of oil, yes, you have to look for such kind of first order field evidences to say that the environment was conducive for first large deposition of organic matter. So you should have large burial of organic matter. So if you think of burial of organic matter, why don't you have large burial of organic matter? If you think of present day system, what do you think? Marshall. 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 Right? Marshall. Ocean. Marshall. Ocean. Ocean or Marshall. Marshall. He is right. Swam. So close to the place where you have. So you are from BSI. Uh, BSI. <laughs> BSI. 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 So you know all these things. Right? Right. I right. 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 So you are a paleontologist. So you know that you get them close to the coast. So all this, what really happened is that. Why do you have large form of life along the coast? As you go to the middle of the ocean, you have less. Why? As you go to the middle of the ocean, you get less life. Why? It depends upon the drift. There's probably less in the ocean. Let others speak. They will not learn. You already know. And <laughs> <laughs> so when you think of life, life requires nutrients. So that requires fresh water which carries a lot of nutrients. You want bottled water, okay? Mineral water. So life requires a lot of mineral water and that comes from continent. We call it the process of weathering. So along the proximity of the continents, you have large weathering where large amount of nutrients are available. What are the major nutrients which are essential for life? You should have 
Hah? Ada jenis? Hah? Nutrients of life. Major nutrients. What is the metaphor? Now the Which get deposited on the top and covered you. Okay, in plant lipids. Okay, so now that makes the architecture. It you get encased. In some cases, you get calcium carbonate as a cover, but you definitely need some of these essential nutrients like phosphate, okay, nitrate, which are life limiting, which are life depends on them. Okay. So if you think of planet Earth today, this is a time scale which broadly many of the geologists they talk about. The time which is called radial. Radial is, can you tell me, what is radial? Hell. This light hell. Yes. The term it comes from. Huh? It is. No. It it's a term which is from Greek, which means. Hell. So there was extreme environment when life was not possible. So this is the time when there was largely no life. No life. It is early part of Earth history. So when Earth formed, was there moon? Moon came less little late. Okay. They came close to the time of around 4.4 billion years. It took about 200 million years for the moon to form. You know how the moon formed? You know how the moon formed? Because of collision. Okay, it drifted apart part of the Earth's outer crust. Okay, and the moon formed later. Is there evidences? Yes, there are evidences. How do you get the evidence of moon formed later than Earth? You can study the rocks. Okay, you can study the rocks. What you can do is that you can measure some of the elemental ratios in materials which are coming from the moon. So at some point of time, we did had a lot of plan for studying the moon. Now we also are studying the moon. India is really looking for water in the moon. Okay. So if we get water, what will happen? We can leave this planet and go to the moon. <laughs> okay? No. Hey. How unique? How human came? No, much later. I will talk about humans. They came because of by a mistake. <laughs> I will talk about human. They came much later. They came in Pleistocene time. So we are here in this part of the world, maybe little around Pliocene time, little older than Pleistocene. The first apes came, primates, and finally the intelligence level started building up. We become technologist, technocrats. We start designing our own stuff, putting keys on top. So this is almost like putting a shell. We put a shell covering us. We know how to maintain the shell, have air condition somewhere. So it came much recently. A human being came much recently. Many of the organisms, they came much earlier. Now the question is about when the life came to the Earth. In some cases, we debate still that are we Martian? Was the life started in Mars and then it came to Earth? Why do you think like that? Because of the time frame of this time period, this early part, you don't have any evidence of life. Any kind of rock records, if you try to read, they don't give you any kind of evidence of life. This alien part. Then you come to a time frame which is around 
four millimeters and onwards, you call it arkin. Arkin? Why arkin? Old. They are old, but you start getting some kind of early life forms like archaea. Have you heard of this bacteria? It's a bacteria. Name is archaea. So people get evidences of archaea, the kind of bacteria, which is like E. coli. Have you heard of this term, E. coli? Yeah. This is all the biologists will look for. They can tolerate large pH, acidic condition. So life like E. coli, archaea, they started populating this point of time. Then came a time and it is called protozoa. You start having a primitive life form. So when I say primitive life form, what does that mean? Algal, mostly algae, which are called in terms of rock, it is called stromatolites. So it's algae which started dominating the planet. So after 0.5 million years, you will start getting all the mega form of life what you see today. So if you think of the entire history of the earth, it is only this part, mega form of life and flora and fauna started populating this planet. Earlier than that, you had all the primitive and bacteria staying. Failure is a time when you don't have supply. So, in earth science, we use this term called billion years or giga. Era. So, it is the time is 10 to the power 9 years. Okay, so it's a quite a big time. You are not talking about 10 to the power minus 9. Okay, that also we talk now. Nah? Nanosecond. So, now we talk about 10 to the power 9 years in terms of years. Here it is plotted in terms of giga annum, giga year. 1 million years is 10 to the power 6 years. So this, all this are called 4 eons. So now, heading is taken here at the time, the formation of the solar system, early addition of the planet, to the origin of life, probably sometime around 4 billion years. So our year, or the time of beginning of the life, is around 4 to 2.5 giga annum. Protrusive from 2.5 to 2.56, and the final cycle is since then. So, this is the important part where we started having life on this planet. So, when you talk about the age of the earth, how do you get the age of the earth? We analyze certain rocks of older time. Where do you get them? You get them in locations where old crust got formed. So, which are the locations where old crust got formed? Its regions are called windstone belts. The region where you can think of getting gold. Okay. So now we are right now in a location which is a windstone belt. So you get a lot of old rocks. So if you think of amount of continental crust through time, what really happened is the continent started building up. There were very few continents in the beginning of Earth's history. They started becoming bigger and bigger, and then the volume of continental material started becoming more and more. Why it should be? What a continent is made up of? When you think of a continent, it is made up of? When you see all the rocks which you see here, it is made up of what? Silicon. Silicon. So this is made up of elements like silica, aluminium, what else? Iron. Iron. Is it? Huh? So it is made up of what? Silicon and aluminium? Primarily, primarily. Primarily, it is made up of silicon and aluminium. If you analyze again the continental rock, you will see that they are made up of silicon and aluminium. And then what happens? As you go to the oceanic crust, it has silicon, but it has magnesium or iron. Okay? So the composition changes. So then, from mantle and wood, what is it made up of? Nickel and zinc. Nickel and zinc. So nickel, cobalt, and iron. Okay, so now this is mantle and this is coal. So what is the earth's atmosphere made up of? So 
top part of the atmosphere, what is it about? To go to the top part of the atmosphere, what is the top part of the atmosphere? Hydrosphere. Huh? Hydrosphere. Hydrosphere. Okay, so what is it about? What is the major conclusion of Hydrosphere? Hydrosphere. Hydrosphere. You will get Ozone in Hydrosphere? So, you had taught this yesterday, a day before, about the radiation. James must have told, told you about radiation, where they must have told that population of atmosphere. And it becomes hydrogen and helium dominated. So, what I am seeing? Can you tell me? Any of you? What is happening? Stratification. Somebody study stratification. This is also called differentiation. Okay, so now I have missed one thing that is hydrosphere. It is primarily water, ocean. That's how the layers are. So things are moving out by some reason. We'll talk about it later. We know this. Most of you know it, but we don't take all. It is simple, straightforward, convinced. We'll go ahead. Okay? So now if you think of continental crust, they are made in made up of silicon and aluminium. Where come they come? Silicon and aluminium. <coughs> get differentiated from mantle. Okay? The things which are there in the mantle, there are this kind of elements like aluminium cannot accommodate in the mantle because of its pressure and the temperature condition. They will always try to prefer to go out. So many of the species like potassium, sodium, which comes as an alkali elements. Okay, they are big in size, they don't get preferred into the mantle. Because mantle, anything which is smaller in size, Get accommodated in the mantle. As soon as you come to the crust, the things which are bigger and lighter, they will come out. So things get differentiated. Once you get differentiated, you form something a continental crust, which is lighter because of its density and gravity. Because of the process of gravity, it tries to be by the process of archaeological, which most of you know, that it start floating. Like ice, you think. It floats. Okay? Now, when you see a floating ice, small portion is there on the top, while the rest of them are below. Like that, Earth is also like that since it is weight. Though you think these are fluids which flow very slowly, but they do act like a fluid. So, you can use, usually use, somebody told physics, microphysics, um, you can use all the law of fluidity to explain the variable nature of materials which are found in the earth. Where the ranging from coal to the top of the atmosphere, you can use. What we will vary is the Reynolds number. The number will vary. The things will become so much more slower. And you don't call them as any longer Reynolds number, you start naming them some other numbers, but they follow the slow start. Okay? So one of the material which comes out that form the metal is zirconium. Okay? It's the element which comes out and form the metal, which we find it in the continental crust. So this is the kind of metal which you get in the continental crust, and you can use because zirconium do accommodate a lot of uranium, you can date them by uranium lead techniques to assign the age. So one can do age determination and try to figure it out what is the kind of age of this metal. You can also analyze them for compositions like ratio of heavier oxygen to lighter oxygen and talk about the environment in which the zirconium is formed. So most of the zirconium they form in the mantle because of high pressure, temperature condition, and then you get exposed to the surface. Some of them they get grounded because of the process of water action. If you leave a mineral for a long time on the water action, like rivers, they get grounded. Based on their shape, it also infer that was there water in the environment or not. So, like that, 
Several zircons through time have been analyzed, and one of the reasons why zircon has been taken is that it is refracted. Many of the females they use it as an ornament. It is refractory, and most of the females they prefer something which is refractory because it doesn't destroy the track. So you can leave it. It's like diamond is for your Okay, people advertise it. Zircon is also refractory, it cannot destroy. It requires somewhere around 1400 degrees Celsius to melt zircon, which is usually not present in the environment. So you don't get such kind of temperature commonly on the surface of the earth. So it gets preserved. So people have dated the zirconium through time and determined the ages. And they talked about different stages of what you call accretion, cooling of earth, late heavy bombardments, and then we were started having mostly the water on this planet. So if I ask you a question, what is the source of water in this planet? Where can we get water in this planet? What is the source of water? We get a lot of water. You drink water, without water you will die. What is the source of water in this planet? Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen. We got hydrogen and oxygen. It formed at the time of Big Bang and stayed, preferred to stay in Earth and not go to any other place or Atmospheric oxygen. Where, where from the water comes? What is the major source of water in this planet? From differentiation of nitrogen oxygen forms. How? We are talking nuclear synthesis. We are talking about nuclear synthesis? Yes, that is CH in cycle. You will definitely form oxygen. Okay, I am telling that. How do you know that water in this planet, what is the major source of water? Is it indigenous? We have water. If you go to the mantle on the core, do you expect water? Or is all the water is there in the atmosphere, it recycles. But there is water in the rocks, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not a molecule that's so We have oxygen and hydrogen separated. Oxygen and so hydrogen separated. But we want a process where they meet and form water. Yeah, so now there are hydrogen minerals. Uh, so I think it's a big question. It's a big question that where from the water came to this planet, and the partly the answer is known. You know that all the if you think of all the planet system of the Earth and the rest of the other planets, Earth is a terrestrial planet. Do you know any other terrestrial planet? Mars, Venus, they are terrestrial planet. When you say terrestrial planets, they have rocks. They have rocks. There are planets which are watery planets, which are made with ice. Do you know any? Pluto, Neptune, Saturn, they are watery. Majority com composition is water. Okay. So now, is there a large interaction which happens between Earth and other planets? So if you just now visit the polar region, what do you see in the polar region? Lot of ice. Okay. So now, even if you see in the dark times, night time, which is sometimes very short, sometimes very prolonged, you will see a lot of water is entering as fall meteorites. So it comes to the extent of gigaton per annum, the water which is entering into our system from outside. And from where these waters are coming, they are coming from the outer planets, which are major constituent of waters. The water stays in most of the polar region where our atmosphere is clean and it comes. Okay? So it comes and as if you think of composition of any kind of meteorites or asteroids, okay, which comes from regions which are between Saturn and Jupiter. So most of them they carry a lot of volumes of water to this planet. So one thing which has been conclusively proved is that there is not large variability of water isotopic composition or water composition if you compare our water with water which is present there in moon water which is present there in Mars. So largely we are getting water from outside. Yes? So how they are giving water being transported in that transportation? What is that? Transportation. So now what is really happening? There is a, some kind of centrifugal force, okay, which is rotating the entire thing, our whole galaxy, okay. Because of the force which it is experiencing, there is always a tendency of coming things from outside to inside. If it is big in volume and size. No, sir, water, what we've been saying, formless water. 
So it doesn't come out as water, rather it comes with rocks. Rocks which is in the form along with water with it. Asteroids and meteorites. So what really happens is that if it falls to the equatorial region, it gets defragmented because of the thick atmosphere. So things get lost. We don't see much of falls in the equatorial region. As we go to the cooler region, we start seeing many falls. You see white patches of ice, and on top you will see many rocks which are there. You don't expect rocks to be there. So these are all falls which are coming from outer space. So is it true like some comets are totally made of ice? Some they comets are totally made of ice. Yeah, they can they can come and they can hit. So like these rocks always go to the north pole, north pole, why? Don't have the equator. That's what I am trying to explain. They come, but they they are not allowed to enter because of the thickness of the atmosphere. If you see that the atmosphere is very thick in the equatorial region, as you go to the polar region, the atmosphere is very thin. So it allows the entry point. So you have to see, so you see activities like auroral activities. Okay, the, there will be a lot of ionosphere you will be able to see closely. Okay, so now what you don't see here in the part of atmosphere, you can study the ionosphere much in detail if you go to the polar region. Okay, because all you go to the elevation, altitude. If you go to the Everest and start analyzing ionospheric composition, it will be much easier compared to doing that at mean sea level. Okay? So now there is some kind of consensus in the geological community right now that the majority of the water which we started recycling that came from outside. Okay, there is very less indigenous water which is there in the land or in the boat. There is no space for water to recycle. Okay. So now what governs the temperature of Earth? So if you think of temperature of the Earth. One of the important factors which governs the temperature of the Earth, which you must have read in your first class, is the distance between Earth and Sun. Okay? So when you think of a distance between Earth and Sun, is it constant? Does it change? When do you think that it will change? So it changes seasonally. So this is a seasonal variability of the distance. It will think talking about different time during the year. So there is a large change between the distance. So if you vary the system, how much temperature you can do? You can change about 0.2% in terms of radiation budget. Okay? Which is coming and it is very small. So now the factors which determine the temperature of the earth is sun earth distance. I will tell you how the sun earth distance can vary apart from this what you are witnessing because sometime we have Aphelion and perihelion system. It comes closer when you have summer, southern hemisphere summer or northern hemisphere summer, or winter when it is little far off. So now this, have you gone through this? That was the radiation balance. So when you think of radiation which is received from the sun, part of this gets reflected. Okay, how much part? Roughly about 30 percent get reflected. And where does reflection happen? Majority of the reflection? Hmm? Polar region. Okay. Polar and which location? So now if you have only polar region, you can have tropical region as well. Where? Huh? Where? So now, if you think of energy absorbed and energy intercepted and energy reflected, you can relate them with a parameter which is a term called albedo. Okay? So the, when you think of albedo, it largely varies between material to material. So what is the albedo of water? If you compare water with ice, which has higher albedo? Ice. ice. So now the proportion of that on the surface of the earth Will it affect the temperature? If you vary the even, don't do anything, just vary the proportion of water and ice on this planet. Will we expect a different temperature on this planet? Yes. yes. You expect. Okay? And you can calculate it based on the law of physics. So you most of you are familiar with this. If you do this calculation putting all the constant, this is this is famous law, which is Stephen Boltzmann law. And then 
you do the energy balance calculations and try to talk about what is the kind of temperature you expect, the temperature that you get is rather very low. What is the kind of temperature you get? This is around minus 18 degrees Celsius. Okay? Or this is also called 0 degree Fahrenheit. So if you have this temperature of minus 18 degree, what will happen? It will be too cold. What is the average temperature of the earth? Huh? What is that? Be louder. 15. So now the difference between 18 and 15, what it is called? What is it called? Greenhouse warming. And that is mostly because of the presence of greenhouse gases. So what are greenhouse gases? So which is more dominant? What are we doing? Okay. But we are not bothered about what we are So we these are the different values. Okay. So let us talk about the greenhouse gases. So now greenhouse gases which we are mostly concerned are these two molecules. Okay, water and CO2. But there are potentials of others. Like if you think of different greenhouse gases, their concentration, okay, in terms of parts per billion. Okay, now we have exceeded this limit, now it is around 400,000 ppb. The rate of increase is also here increasing to time, more and more. This rate is not constant, this changes. Okay, so now it absorbs, but there are other gases too, like methane, which has enormous potential. Now, why oxygen is not a greenhouse gas? When you think of oxygen, it is not a greenhouse gas. It is not absorb any infrared radiation. Why? Why? Why oxygen, nitrogen, it doesn't absorb any infrared radiation? Because for absorbing infrared radiation, there needs a change in dipole. And oxygen in the molecular state, it is symmetric, so the dipole is not change. So, do you know any diatomic molecules which is absorbs infrared radiation? Nitrogen. Do you know diatomic molecules? Diatomic means two atoms there which can absorb infrared radiation. No. Huh? Hydrochloric acid. It should be when you think of hydrochloric acid vapor, does it absorb? HF vapor, hydrochloric acid, this is diatomic, chlorine and hydrogen, they absorb. But you don't have them in large quantity in the atmosphere. Okay. So it has to be first triatomic where you have a symmetry violation and first you start having a mode of vibration where you expect large infrared radiation to get absorbed. So now CO2 and water molecules, they act as one of the important species in the atmosphere which absorb radiation and it heats up the plants. So now when you think of this 33 degrees Celsius which is minus 18 and 15 degree, that is what is mostly contributed, contributed by these two molecules, water vapor and the CO2 which we call it as a greenhouse gases. So now if you think of sun as such, sun is like one of the star which has been seen to be following some kind of main sequence star. So now many of you have read this in physics that sun is one of the main sequence stars. This is evolving. We know from the world it has evolved over time. It was earlier very small, it becomes red giant and then it will start gradually warming. And we know that the sun will be different with over a period of time. So now we are right now at this point in the life cycle. So now based on that, what people like Carl Sagan's and others, they try to see that sun was being painted in the beginning, when the sun earth was formed. When the earth was formed around 4.6 million years, it was, as I mentioned, that universe formed around, our universe formed around 14 to 15 billion years back. 14 to 15 billion years, we a lot that. So this is the time when Earth formed. So Sun was very really faint. It, there is no doubt about it because we know that similar kind of stars like Sun they used to be faint because in life, study their life cycle. 
that they were fended. So, and then you expect that the sun was fended and having given less luminosity, the solar constant which you talk about, <coughs> it cannot hold solar. It has to be lower. So, they, they, must, they call it faint young sun paradox. Paradox, what is the paradox? It was fended. So, you expect everything to be cooler. So, you have large glaciers. What they found is that no, 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 early earth was very warm, hot. So it was having what temperature, which is roughly the temperature which is shown here. So now, between this range. So now most of the evidences, geological evidences, they support that earth was really warm. So now this becomes paradox. Which then we should be cold, make the earth cold, it lead to such kind of warming. So now, the reason why it was warm was because of the presence of more amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, like Venus, which has large amount of greenhouse gases compared to, if you think of Mars and Venus, what is the temperature of the Mars? I believe. It was in news. Who was in media? You should tell. What is the temperature of the Mars? Minus how much? Recently, Places in the United States has experienced that kind of temperature. They said that huh? minus 50 degrees Celsius. So recently, what happened that places in the United States they experienced such kind of cold temperature. And they say that we are up to almost like Mars, getting a similar kind of temperature. Okay, what is the temperature of Venus? No, it is around 460 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now that is because of the predominant gas in Venus is CO2. Okay, it has huge concentration of CO2 in their atmosphere. So it acts as a, some kind of greenhouse warming to the planet. So what we are experiencing on Earth is something called runaway greenhouse effect. Things, uh, CO2 has been converted to something else. We will see that what it has been converted in biogeochemical cycle lecture. That what CO2 which you dump into the atmosphere, it gets converted. What is the major source of CO2? Mm -hmm. So the factors which is a mechanism which drives the sun earth distance is given by this person called Milankovitch. What he told is that there is a factor that from eccentricity of the elliptic precision, this tree dominates the earth's sun distance and the earth's planet. Not planet. We talk about the glaciation deglaciation. And how it works? So it works like this. The precision, for example. So it is precision. So it is moving like this. So now this precision angle changes by one degree. And then you can what you can do is that you, you can come and have temperature which is rather very different. Now when you think of obliquity, which is this angle, which is 23.5, but it varies by one degree again. So now the orbital eccentricity, that means it can go maximum in terms of ellipse and then it can go to maximum to circle, that also changes, it can become like this. So now people have seen, based on the geological archives which I was talking, that there is some kind of cyclicity of this. That's the frequency by which the earth behaves. And why this frequency, how that is determined? That is determined mostly based on astronomical position of the bodies. Like they, the Jupiter is very close by, it influences Earth's orbit through the parameters and as a result you expect Earth's orbital parameters to vary and you expect the difference distance. And this is the work which was done largely by a mathematician. And the name was the language. He contributed this and predicted that the climate is going to vary to the standard over a time scale of 100,000 years, 41,000 years and something around 10,000 years of based on the periodicities. And this predictability has been seen mostly based on the free ring studies. When you see dendrochronology, it is a subject which evolved because of the Milankovitch hypothesis need to be tested. So they try to see that whether first, if you talk about sun as important parameter, whether that influences the climate. So when you think of a precision, 21, 22 kilogram size, this is the frequency it looks like. And the obliquity, it is 41 kilo years, the frequency looks like this. And the eccentricity is 28 kilo years. So when you see a temperature record, which is largely like this, combining all these three parameters, you will see that kind of variability, which is largely a 
some kind of thing saw kind of pattern, which you observe over the last hundred thousand years, maybe millions of years. So now you, when you see such features, it means glaciation and you have heat glaciation. Another important factor, as I mentioned, is continents in time. So now the volume of continents which we see today, the volume of continents has changed over a period of time. So there are very less number of continental landmass in the region. And then you start having a large continental landmass, which is what we see present day. And as a result, the angles has changed. Our landfill remains are always constant. Now, predominant between water and ice relationship drives the angle of this planet. But in geological past, of course, the volume of the continent do has an important role to play when you talk about the planet's temperature. This is another important factor, so like greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, what are the prominent greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? As I mentioned, CO2. The natural sources of CO2 is mostly volcanic eruptions. They come from the volcanoes. You can have, what is this? Volcanoes? No. Industrials. Okay, anthropogenic. Okay, so now you have volcanoes, you have anthropogenic. And what are this? Huh? What? Ocean. Ocean can you put in fire like this? Fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. These are called methanes. These are called methane gas hydrates. Okay, they look like this. You get in ocean flows. Methane do get formed as a rock, get consolidated. So in certain position, portion of the Earth ocean, you have large deposits of this kind, which escapes, which escapes to warm the planet. So now there is a big concern that. If we warm our planet, the first thing what will happen is that methane, which has been formed as a hydrate, gas hydrate or clathrates, okay, they will escape and become part of the atmosphere. And you know that methane has a tremendous potential, 25 times more potential to warm this planet. So it will be highly what? Dangerous. So it will be better to convert this methane to CO2 or else great devastation. So as a result of that, but it's now told by all the oil companies throughout the world that let us hunt for all the methane gas hydrates. We will just take them out or else they will escape and that will create a situation which will be really unstable. Okay. So now what finally we need to is that the methane form which we are seeing today is now getting exploited. Now we are trying to exploit it. What is the other places where you get methane? You get them below the ice sheets. All the Antarctic and Arctic ice sheets, below that you have large concentration of methane. As the ice will melt, you will see the methane escaping. And that has 25 times more potential to warm up this planet compared to CO2. Okay? So it will become much, much dangerous and you will exponentially rise the temperature in much sharper way. Okay? This thermal frost thing is the same as methane. Methane. So methane get formed in the below and even in the soil. In the soil. So now let us summarize history of Earth's climate. Earth formed around 4.6 billion years ago. Originally very hot and sun energy output was only 70% of the present. Liquid water present around 4.3 billion years based on the dating observations which we have seen. Much of the Earth's early history erased during the late bombardment, which we'll discuss now. So now, since I was telling the Earth would have a very thick atmosphere in the beginning, it experienced large bombardments. When I say large bombardment, it is bodies which are coming from outside, they are impacting the Earth. Okay? And we have witnessed this very recently. We know that one of the recent such kind of bombardment happened. Huh? Germany. Huh? Jupiter. 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 Other planets have happened, but not it has happened. It has not. It has killed few people, but not as the. Russia. Happened in Russia. Very recently. A big asteroid came and hit. Okay. Not the size of what happened in the time of dinosaur extinction. Okay. But it was big enough. So now such kind of bombardment was much common in the early beginning of the Earth's history. As soon as the atmosphere becomes thick, 
this bombardment becomes much, much smaller. So the, in the beginning it was much larger, then when there was a period when there was heavy bombardment, perhaps this was a time that the resistance got thinned further because the first glaciers got formed.